Hi there everyone and welcome back to Advanced Higher Biology. Today we're going to be finishing off the third key area of Unit 1, Membrane Proteins, by looking at the second part of this key area, 3B, Ion Transport Pumps and the Generation of Ion Gradients. So to start off with, in 3A we looked at some of the movements of molecules across the plasma membrane or the cell membrane and we're going to go into a little bit more detail about this. So first of all, for a solute carrying a net charge, the concentration gradient and the electrical potential difference are going to combine to form something called the electrochemical gradient and that is going to actually determine the transport of the solute. Now, quite a few terms for you here. First of all, the concentration gradient. Hopefully you remember that, going back to National 5, we looked at the concentration gradients being the movement from, for example, a lower concentration to a higher concentration, going up a concentration gradient, and therefore being active and requiring energy, or the movement from a higher to lower concentration, which is going down the concentration gradient and is passive and does not require energy. What you'll not have heard of before, though, is this electrical potential difference. What this is, is also something that we call a membrane potential. And that's created when there's a difference in the electrical charge on the two sides of the membrane. So the outside and the inside. And both of those, if they have a difference in electrical charge, that's going to create that membrane potential. And as we said, both of those are going to combine to form that electrochemical gradient, which is going to transport that solute. Now, the electrical chemical gradient is going to form due to the net positive charge outside the cell, and then the net negative charge inside the cell and that's going to be important in terms of determining the movement of those different solutes. Now we're going to really focus on a major part of cell biology here called the sodium potassium pump. So these ion pumps such as the sodium potassium pump are going to use energy. Now we remember this before from higher if it's a pump then it's actively transporting a molecule if you think about if you're having to try and pump something you have to put energy into this. And we also mentioned in key area 3A that that hydrolysis of ATP is going to be used in that, that movement, in that process, and that's going to establish and maintain ion gradients. Now, in terms of sodium-potassium pump, obviously it involves sodium and potassium. What's going to happen is ions are going to be transported against a very steep concentration gradient, so going from a lower to higher concentration. So that's going to use energy directly from ATP hydrolysis, using those ATP as we mentioned before. So this is going to actively transport three sodium ions out of the cell, and at the same point is then going to go and transport two potassium ions into the cell. And it will be back and forth in terms of your sodium and potassium each time. Really important that you remember the numbers involved, so three sodium, two potassium, and also the three sodium are going out of the cell and the two potassium are going into the cell. So in terms of breaking this up into stages, and the diagrams on the right hand side might help you out here, we're going to be looking at how these different ions get transported, just refresh your memory of the numbers of them, where they're going, but we're also going to be talking about that conformational change in a protein again, so that change in shape. So what's going to happen first of all is this pump is going to have a high affinity for sodium ions inside the cell. So hopefully you remember of affinity, that means that they want to bind, there's that space there for those sodium ions inside the cell to come across the sodium potassium pump and they're going to bind to that pump. And you can see here in the diagram the ball moving in. So these uh, sodium ions, they're going to bind and then that pump is going to be phosphorylated by ATP, so that energy is going to be provided. And that conformation of the protein is then going to change, as you can see, going from this to this. So this conformation changes, that affinity for the sodium ions is now going to decrease, which then means those sodium ions are going to be released. So the sodium ions have now been transported and been released outside of the cell through that conformation change, but also that change in affinity for the sodium ions. So those three sodium ions have been released. What's now going to happen is those two potassium ions are going to bind outside the cell. So again, we have this change in conformation where the sodium ions have been released, and it's now returned from potassium to come across and bind outside. And then there's going to be dephosphorylation that's going to occur. So that protein is going to change conformation back to its original state, its original shape. And in so doing that, it's then going to release those potassium ions. They're going to be taken into the cell, the affinities back to the beginning, and this process can keep going on. So what to do is this could sometimes be an extended answer question or just trying to show your knowledge of any of the processes involved here. 
particularly the phosphorylation, the dephosphorylation, and the numbers of sodium and potassium. So maybe go through those and try and break them down as much as you can, and hope that makes a bit of sense to you. Now, in terms of the sodium potassium pump, it's found in most animal cells, and it is going to account for a high proportion of that basal metabolic rate we've talked about in many organisms. So remember that energy is required for this to take place, the pump is an active process. What we're going to take a little look at, though, is how this actually works in the intestine, because in the intestine, in the epithelial cells, this sodium potassium pump is going to generate a sodium ion gradient across the plasma membrane. What that is going to do is that's going to drive the active transport of glucose into the intestine. So that's going to be quite important as well. So because of this process taking place, that's then going to help in turn the, the transport of glucose. So what happens in this is that the glucose transporters that are put in the sort of orange side here, responsible for moving the glucose ions, they are going to be transporting sodium ions and glucose at the same time and in the same direction. So that's quite important. It's taking place at the same point and they're also going in the same direction. What's going to happen is sodium ions are going to enter the cells, the intestinal epithelial cells, down their concentration gradient, as we've said before. So that means they're moving from a higher concentration of sodium to a lower concentration of sodium within the intestinal cells. So down the concentration gradient, not requiring energy. But the simultaneous transport of that glucose is going to pump glucose into the cell against the concentration gradient. So moving from a lower concentration to a higher concentration against and up a concentration gradient that requires energy. And that's all you need for this part of the course, okay? So please make sure you go back and have a look at the process of the sodium potassium pump and make sure you're also aware of the numbers involved, the phosphorylation that's involved, and also how this works in this process here for sodium ions and glucose uh, in the in the intestinal cells as well. That's all for Kira 3, and I'll see you next for communication and signaling. That's Kira 1.4. Thanks so much for everyone for listening. Bye for now.